Misha Kubal. It is a real pleasure to have you on this program about counter memories. I'm really delighted you could take our invitation. Tell me, first of all, where, where do I find you at this moment? Where are you? I can't quite tell. I'm in the synagogue, a uh, former synagogue um, in Stomme, which is part of the small city of Pulheim, next to Cologne, on the left bank of the River Rhine. Before 1938, uh, more than 12 synagogues had been operating um, and doing service to the Jewish community in this area. But after the pogrom, only this little um, synagogue, who is kind of in a backyard, not in the center of the city, a um, little bit hidden, um, has survived as it was in use already for the farmer's uh, storage room. So I'm, I'm going back to a space where I have a very strong relation to, as I uh, did a project here in 1994, uh, 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 Refraction House. And since then, um, I kept in contact with the, with, with the people who had been establishing this program, Gerhard Dornseifer and Angelika Schallenberg. And Misha, you, you, you just mentioned that you have a strong relationship to that space. I'd like you to unpack uh, what that strong relationship is, perhaps in the context of what one might call uh, the arc of your career, um, telling the, the viewers a little bit about what you did before and how you came upon this synagogue and why altogether a synagogue. Yeah, I was born actually in Dusseldorf, which is just a, a half an hour um, car ride from Stommel. And um, I was actually first time uh, in contact with the synagogue in 1991 as they started their arts program. And I have to commit that from the very first mo moment, I was uh, struck by the, let's say, the uh, conceptual precision how they operated in this small village of just 10,000 people. They brought in international artists, starting with Janice Kunelis, Richard Serra, and then the first German artist had been Georg Baselitz in 1993. Um, before I get a little bit getting deeper into what I did here in Stommel, I have to admit that I was not trained as an artist, first of all, uh, but I was interested in the realm of cultural activities, including literature, performance, dance, and uh, theater, opera. And so I wasn't, I wasn't sure what, what would be my method, my material at, uh, in, um, at first hand. And um, after a while, I started performing in public space in 1977, a little bit more in the, let's say, post-punk um, attitude where I was asking, you know, for space, to like to uh, squatter buildings and to operate in public space in a very unorthodox way and not trained in art academies, as art academies also refer to institutionalized uh, art training programs. I was a little bit kind of stepping away from that um, kind of education. I was studying psychology, social pedagogic. I was interested in relationships. So the, the perspective I had was very much uh, emphasized on artists who operated in public space. Just to mention Franz Erhard Walter, who, as he defined art practice as an action space, as an action room, and sub consequently, I'm, I was very pleased when he accepted an invitation to do a piece here in Stommeln um, two years ago. So um, I was more, my, my, the idea of a, of a studio uh, generally was very much driven by, let's say, subject matters I, was, I became interested in. So it was the physical relation between the body and the public space. In that context, uh, people like Eva Hesse, but also um, Bruce Nauman come into play. And, um, well, I'm still interested in this art practice. And now since I'm teaching, uh, since the early 90s, uh, my my, let's say, hesitation and criticism on institutional education has not changed. But now I'm part of this, uh, let's say, of a program where I can work with students on a project-based relationship, which I personally take a lot of advantage from, and I, benef I take all the benefits from this ongoing discourse and discussion format. I'm, I'm very interested in that, yeah. 
No, so uh, b- before we get to Strommel and how maybe your former studies in psychology inform the work you do now uh, with light, I think there's a very interesting dialogue uh, to be established there. Talk about that hesitation and that criticism. Well, it's it's very difficult. I mean, I was like, you know, I was an 18-year-old uh, kind of um, an adolescent person when I started to to uh, um, to do my first experiments, a little steps into public space. I mean, most of the motivation was driven by the idea of provocation. Um, and it's still kind of a little bit part of my package. So provocation means doing non-authorized things in public space to see how reaction could be, not walk the, through the administration rather than to make a shortcut into public uh, reactions. And public action and reaction is a, um, is a bipolar structure I'm very interested in. My hesitation is a criticism against um, most of the um, strategies of education. The, 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 the aspects of delivering knowledge is uh, most of the time very old-fashioned and single, single channelized. It's not really reversible. So I kept this criticism um, also in my art practice since today. So I just recently established a um, public action towards a political disaster here in the city of Cologne. And I was not asked to react, but I did it um, like in, in the middle of the night, I was setting a scenario, I was putting a sign on, which was marking a place. And the next minute after I did it, not authorized, the police was protecting my interaction. And then the political parties and the government, the local government of the city, of the municipality, had to accept my gift. So I'm, and as an artist, I use light, I use public awareness as an instrument, a method to generate um, public um, discourse and public discussion. Let's talk about the public discourse and the public discussion you brought about or you triggered in the very synagogue where you're sitting now. Yeah. What yeah. happened? Describe that action and describe how you really worked with the notion of frustration. Well, it's, um, I have to admit that um, it's all starting with a research and observation phase. And in this phase, I realized that, um, let's say, the exhibition artist I mentioned before, starting with Cunelis, Sarah, and then finally Baslitz, what they established was a discourse which was embedded in a, let's say, art practice. So they, you know, this former synagogue turned out to be an exhibition venue. People were coming and being triggered to go there to see an exhibition. And I'm very honest, I found at a certain point, I found it a little bit inappropriate to the situation just to decontextualize the space from its history and the neighborhood. So my idea was to lock the building, to put strong lights inside and let the light be the light bridge, a immaterial, ephemeral connection to the neighborhoods. And the windows are just right behind me. And these light beams were interacting with the neighbors. And so they were stakeholders in the process of being asked and promoting the idea that, you know, in the situation where right-wingish um, people in Germany were attacking um, cemeteries of, of uh Jewish graveyards and also um, expressing their anti-Semitic attitudes so publicly. So these people were very brave here in Stommeln to accept a 24-hour uh, installation for three months being lit up, being visible, so visible that, that you know, you couldn't, I mean, it's like, you know, you enter, you enter the zone and you were in front of the locked door and you were situated in the limelight of the synagogue, but you were also excluded as the Nazi regime excluded the Jewish community in this specific village. How did the neighbors react? Surprisingly, none of them are Jewish, so they've never been inside the synagogue. 
So what we did, we, I, I built a small model just to, just to visualize the idea. So I, I contextualized the synagogue and put the model in the synagogue, invited the people to come first place and being the first, let's say, um, witness of that action to be scheduled for the year after. And I was, I was tremendously touched how close they reacted and how they expressed their I mean, empathy to defend this artistic um, intervention as it would kind of provoke also the right-wingish people, maybe not in Stommeln itself, but in the greater neighborhood of the bigger cities around. So I, I'm, still, I'm still touched by, by the braveness of the neighborhood. And what they did to the, to, the, to the media, for instance, so I was not really, since I... Once I was done with the installation, the neighbors took on the mission of transporting, transmitting, and communicating the project. And I think that the power and the endurance of the discourse established since Refraction House in 94, it's based on this foundation that people started to think about, to talk about, and to stand for. So the oral history and the absence of the project, but the oral history is still there. So maybe the absence of the project has its own energy, which is still in the in the air and floating around and and steering up little 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 um, moments where people start thinking about how memory and memorance and interaction from art to this specific subject matter could be established. Using light in this context is not at all innocent and light has a history and it has a particular history in the Nazi regime, uh, a history you, Misha, are very, very aware of. And in some way, one could say that your own work is in dialogue with that history, but also in opposition to it. And there's a kind of an archaeology to uh, to light uh, uh, a his a deep history, and I would like you to to perhaps comment on this notion of light during the Nazi regime and what you, Misha Kubal, did with light as it pertains to the synagogue in Stromern. Mm. I think it's yeah. I'm I'm very glad that you 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 address this question to me, Paul, because I think it's one of the most crucial points. If you, if you start working on something and you are in the middle of the research and the conceptual phase has created its own energy, there is a self-motion uh, thing going on. And it's good to have a reflection, someone who gives you a feedback to what you're doing. And when I was working on this project, Refraction House, I wrote in my conceptual first draft something like high-voltage um, light sources. And I sent this um, conceptual draft to Peter Sloterdijk, the German philosopher who, who is based in Karlsruhe. And uh, he responded and said, I'm in principle, I do like the idea, but I have, a, I have a little bit of a difficulty by using this extreme, you know, like high voltage, because that was too strong to the light domes, too close to the light domes of Albert Speer when he created this um, light dome to gather 250,000 people in Nuremberg to give them a feeling that the light is created in architecture, which has also dome stands for cathedral. So get them into a surrounding environment and also in the way of manipulation. I think light can manipulate. It can stand for enlightenment. It can stand for communication but also it can stand for mass murder. So I think this is this kind of contradiction was always on at hand and it has to be taken into consideration and it has to be taken um, to carry on in a very sensitive way. So I was very glad that Peter Sloterdijk gave me this feedback and corrected also this kind of notion. I never had this on mind for sure, but you know, it's good to have a preventive moment there and a, um, a pause for reflection and then move on. You, you said you're, you're creating 
I, I find the term very interesting. You're creating a stress field. What did you mean by that? Um, I think it's, well, once you are, I mean, I mean, there are so many things you have to take into consideration. So first of all, as a non-member of the Jewish community, come to Stommel and lock the door and make the access impossible and put the lights in there and, and then create a stage where people are arriving and departing and get this feeling of being ex excluded. I think this, this has some aggressive excluded connotation. Excluded and exposed. Exactly, yes. And there was this German writer, Burkhard Brunn, who was a long life partner of uh, Charlotte Posenenske, the German artist who stopped making art because she thought that art is not making, changing the society, but that's why she, she changed into a, a different subject matter. But, um, I think Burkhard Brunn, he wrote for the, for the German uh, newspaper. He said, either the synagogue glows or it burns. So the idea of the rays of light could also not only stand for enlightenment and connection to the people, but also could also stand for the self-destruction moment. And I think this ambiguity is strong because we are sitting here in the former synagogue because the Jewish community had left. Basically, most of the families, as we did research on that, left for Tel Aviv. And Interesting is that neither through Cornelis or Sarah or Baselitz, but through locking the synagogue and getting the light in conversation with the neighbors, the Jewish communities from other cities asked the question, why we are not trying to bring back Jewish communities, families back to Stommel so the synagogue could be in service again. And I think that's quite interesting that th this notion of feedback and response was coming through this excluding again and bringing in the light is a, in this kind of strong sculptural um, component. And also shedding the light on the synagogue must have made the inhabitants of Strommeln discover a new building in their town. Did that happen? Because I remember when I worked at the New York Public Library, um, I invited the artist Jenny Holzer to do a project where we lit up the library and she, and on the walls of the library on Fifth Avenue, there were poems projected of recently declassified material, which was itself very interesting because the library is all about classification. And I remember being with Jenny Holzer at the corner of Fifth Avenue and 40th Street and people would say, would walk by and ask Jenny or ask me or ask us both, tell me, what is that building? Discovering the New York Public Library for the first time because it was lit up. I wonder if a certain kind of consciousness of what had been once an operating synagogue and had stopped being a synagogue so many years ago, if that came into being for the inhabitants of Strommel. Yeah, partially, partially, yes. Um, especially when you look back to the history, when the synagogue was not in operation, even before the pogroms in 1938. The question is, what happened between that period of time and 1991? And it is due to the fact that there is a, there's a, a serviceman from the, um, from the, from the fire, fire, um, fire workers who was putting together a private initiative and collecting money to refurbish uh, the former synagogue. And that's why we are sitting in a reconstructed and restorated building. And from there on, the question was, if there is no Jewish community, so what else can be done there? And then it was Angelika Schallenberg and Gerhard Donseifer in, in 91 thinking what would be an appropriate format. And they established this project also to start a dialogue between contemporary art, art practice, and let's say what we would call shaping memories and shaping history. So, I mean, how do we remember things? I think it's, it's about, it's a mix of facts, historical facts where we have exact dates with exact um, um, information. And then we have narratives and we are kind of mingling and mixing all these 
stories here and there and put them together, and then we have very personal common commentaries on that. And I think what what your experience refer with Jenny's uh, Jenny Holzer's intervention is that the light projection made the public library even more visible as it is. Everyone who knows the library would say, well, I mean, it doesn't need this. But for those who just walk by, it's just another building, will never forget what they have seen through this installation. And being in the backyard, not being in the front line of the street facing the market, it was so easy to forget the history of that particular building who has been going through some little history since the myth of the 19th century. So in, in a way, the, the question I had for you is, are you, are you trying to represent memory or to trigger memory? I think that I'm, I'm, I'm more the trigger person. I'm interested in triggering because, because I do not have a ready to deliver concept on what memory is and what history is. I think History is a puzzle. Memory is a puzzle. And as you may know that in the psychology, there is this term of flashlight memory, something which gets steered and generated um, through an impulse. And I think one installation, just in the glimpse of the eye, can, like the projection of Jenny's at the public library or the glimpse of the light at the synagogue during Refraction House, could start as a flicker in your eye, then generating this memory. Oh, there was something going on there. And from that point, this red ribbon can go any direction. People will have their own personal memories. And when we collected it from the neighbors, I found out there's, there are different layers, how people either physically, personally um, had experienced that period of time, or just that my grandma and my grandpa has had been telling had kept telling me about this history, but I never experienced it myself. But still, we carry on. And I think I'm interested in, in the trigger because it gives more, it gives more um, a broader sense of what, what's out there. It can, it can be enriched. And if you look at other works I have been doing for the last four decades, some of the work specifically could be, if categorized as being a provocative, trigger uh, moments in public space rather than a substantial uh, statement which has a long-term um, commitment to public space and public awareness. So it's a little bit more ephemeral structure I'm interested in in my art well, practice. Also, the trigger is interesting because your your project in Strommeln is, has an evanescent quality. Uh, you were mentioning Eva Hesse, um, I see the I see the connections there. It's it's something that has an incredible power when the when the synagogue is lit up and the light shines on all the neighbors. And when the lights go off, it still continues. Exactly. It it lasts beyond that. And and um, Misha, where are you now? You, where are you sitting? What is around you? Can you can you describe a little bit, nearly give a, a tactile feeling of of this synagogue? Yeah, it's a very exclusive moment to be inside the synagogue and not being involved as an artist doing working on a project. I'm not in the moment in the in the mood of installing or, or dismantling a piece, but I'm here just uh, you know to comment and reflect on it. And I think. This room, for me, this space in particular, is a room for reflection. And if I'm, when I'm sitting here um, with this um, kind of void space in here, it also is, uh, it's filled with all the experiences, all the artists. It, I forgot to mention Eduardo Chilida, Rebecca Horn, um, Rosemarie Trockel, uh, Lawrence Wiener, uh, Valid Rod, Franz Ed Walter I mentioned, and just recently we had Daniel Biren. I mean, there was a list of artists who came here. The echo, echoes, echoes, echoes yes. everywhere and resonance everywhere. Another word you love. Exactly. If you're talking about resonant, um, I, I think it's, it's strong that uh, um, So Lewitt was building a wall inside the synagogue and behind the wall was the empty Torah shrine. And he put a lamento, a sound behind it. 
So it was, it's very, I mean, all the artists who came here did a site specific commitment to the synagogue Stammeln. And it doesn't matter what kind of level of career they had. They always started from the space itself, from the, from the history, from this, I would call it a kind of sediment of history. They were just putting another layer in and the next artist is coming reflecting on that. And it's interesting to be part of that. I would call it a family coming together here for um, more than 30 years and practicing and, and experimenting with the space and the neighborhood and the community and delivering to a greater discourse. There are all these voices of all these artists in, in, in the space you are in now, but there's also what you like to refer to as the presence of absence. There's also the emptiness. There's also the community that has been emptied out. Yes. And that must, that must carry a certain amount of weight for you as well. And Misha, in a, in a, in a previous conversation we had, you spoke, you told me that you would be sitting on an uncomfortable chair. And I'm wondering, are you, are you sitting on that uncomfortable chair? And why, why did you make a point of telling me that? To think about that particular, um, part of the German history, um, it, we cannot be in a comfort zone to discuss this. So it's not only the chair, it's the temperature. We had minus five degrees last night and we are now, we're having something like three to six inside the room so it's really chilly it's i could create some steam in front of me so it's um but it's i think it's necessary uh to 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 mark this as a as a as a discourse um platform to say okay this is an uncomfortable zone but we have to be there we have to start a discussion we have to be part of this and we cannot avoid this we cannot ignore this and it's, it's not about making um, publications on it, but it's about discussing it and being part of this um, controversy, which is uh, it's very strong right now, also in Germany. And I, you can trigger that. What, what, what is the controversy that is going on now in Germany? Because I can tell you, on the American side, someone like Brian Stevenson has tended to praise the way in which Germany has dealt uh, with the Holocaust and with its past. And though that is interesting, I'm wondering, since you are in situ, if you agree. I mean, one has to understand, both, we both are in a protected room. We are in a safe space. But outside this safe space, I have to admit that through the right-wingish populist movement, which is called AfD, Alternative für Deutschland in Germany, there are, this is not an alternative for Germany because they are, they, they are working on their own facts and, and they are creating their own reality. And that includes to ignore that Holocaust concentration camp and the genocide did exist. And since, I mean, as long as this notion in the society is not just a notion, but it's becoming a certain popularity. It has been transmitted through diverse media. I think it's, it's important to stand up and it also um, creates an importance for projects such as Synagogue Stommel, but also all the other actions like protesters in the street. So if these people are gathering like 2,000, 10,000 people will be, will be on the other side and demonstrating against them. So I think this has to be um, supported and it has to be lively uh, generated through a I think also lively discourse it's not only about reading and writing but it's about reading writing and acting and I think art is a very good method and practice to be on the side of the of those who are creating an, uh, an awareness and also keeping an, a critical eye on those who may be just intended to forget <laughs> What do I see behind you? Behind me is the um, the former Torah shrine, which is is not a, is not containing a Torah anymore. And if you have a second, I I gonna check what's inside. Okay. Oh, I'd love that. Take your time. Okay, I will.
this is a, an interesting result, one could say. Um, it's a publication, and it's made to be taken from here for free. It doesn't has any ISBN or whatever kind of code. It's made for the synagogue in Stommel to refill, as a brevier, to refill the empty Torah shrine. This project is made by Christoph Keller and Bureau Mirko Borsche. Mirko Borsche is a, um, a book designer. He's based in Munich. And Christoph Keller started as an artist and then turned out to be an art publisher. Revolver Publishing was uh, his mission for about uh, 15 years. Then he was also making schnapps. Very interesting. So he understood the idea of, um, I would say, transformation. So he has this sense to understand what is what has to be done. So when he was here, he just opened the door for the public. People could go to the, to the shrine, open it, and take a book. And as you can see it here, the book already has this mold here, this, you know, if, if books get into water and that they kind of become to smell. But this is digitally transformed, transmitted, and printed on the book. So it has already this idea that it has carried already history. And as Jewish publication, it starts from the back to the front. The font, the typo, is called Synagoge Stommel. So it is also carrying its character, and it's about the idea what is overlapping between the Bible and the Torah. So this is operating in this, it has no pictures in there, it's very difficult to see from here, and it has a little bit of a, and you see what I see and you see behind me is made on this, one second, and this small little picture which is contained in the book. Can you see it? I can. Yes. So it shows, it shows the space with the closed and locked uh, Torah shrine. Well, it's, it's an interesting uh, project. And I think all, as I mentioned before, all the projects are, you know, interlinking and inter and layered with all the um, artworks who had been hosted in, in this um, project by Angelica and Gerhard for uh, 30 years now. And I think this is, a, I, I like the concept. It's just one artist, one work, once a year. So it's not about inflation, inflation of memory. It's about specification of an artist trigger moment, which comes to life in this room. I mentioned before to you the, the word you so much lo love of, of resonance. And how do you think about resonance in the context of different spaces? I know, for instance, you have applied that term of resonance to other works you have done. And, and one of them, which I really would like you to tell our viewers about, is your, your work with a tram. Yes. <laughs> it's, such, it's such an interesting project, and it's such an interesting project because it uses light in, an, in yet another way. But yeah. perhaps, again, to trigger, it's a moving target that is trying to trigger something very, very special for all the passengers who might want to get into the tram. Yeah, I think it's, it was a very interesting experience and in many ways, it was an initiative by a, a very young group of uh, curators in the city of Katowice in the southern part of Poland. And it was interesting because they invited me to take a look at the city and then maybe come up with ideas. And uh, when I was there, I was taking a tram to get to one place. And um, on, the, on the tram, I met people. So I understood that in through conversations that these trams were responsible to bring the employers, the workers, the blue collar workers basically to the coal mining in the center of the city coming from different parts of Katowice. So these trams are very regional. So they really collect people from different parts um, of, of the region and uh, to their work and back home. So my proposal was to generate a ghost tram the ghost tram was done, I used a regular tram, 
painted it completely white, used frost foil to, to kind of a, make it like a screen, a movable screen. And we put strong lights in there. And we found a volunteer driver, a woman, Olga, uh, and asked her to appear and disappear randomly on the railway tracks in the city of Katowice. And the only thing she did, she was driving. And it says on the sign where you always find the information of destination, it says in Polish, Donetsk, that means nowhere. And she was taking five nights in an irregular um, rhythm. So she was appearing and disappearing in a very unpredictable way to the people and also to myself. And she was collecting, obviously, memories from other people. So we got an email from the mayor's office saying that people were sending information to the mayor's office like my grandmother and my grandfather had been sitting in that streetcar. And obviously it was not Olga. It was the projection of the, the, the people as in the Nazi regime, you know, Auschwitz, Auschwitz is only 60 kilometers away from Katowice. So my artistic intervention of a moving light tram generated, triggered the memory of those who had experienced that their family, relatives and friends had been taken to a concentration camp in Auschwitz and been on the death row and could not escape this genocide. So the tram becomes a screen for memory projection. I never intended that as I wrote a concept paper saying, I want to do this, I want to do that. I thought if we do such a kind of intervention in the city of Katowice, I'm interested and curious to see what kind of, let's say, narrative will be projected on that intervention in the public space. So I learned from the people rather than that I was um, opposing my ideas to the public. Did you encounter anger? Yes, we had some anger. Yes, also true. Yes, you, you remembered correctly. Um, people were blocking the street as they were uh, suffering from the lack of information. So they stopped the streetcar and knocked at the door and get it, tried to get in conversation with Olga, but she was resisting. She was keeping in the dark because you cannot lit up her little cabin. Driving cabin has to be dark. And then she was just waiting as long as the person needed to, you know, kind of shouting at her or whatsoever, yelling at her. And then the guy or the person took the car and passed and so she could continue. She was not stopping in a regular way. She was always in transit. I think this is also interesting because it was a dysfunctional movement of a functional tool in the public transportation. So there was the notion of function and dysfunction and then the trigger in terms of the perfection of transport system of the Nazi regime to bring more than 300,000 um, people to the concentration camp number two in Auschwitz. It's very powerful also to choose, um, to choose a transportation device. Um, it, it, on the one hand, I see it as going back to what the Nazis, as you said, perfected so well, which is transporting people to their deaths, but also transporting memories. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, there was also a risk, but as I said before, it is it was not intended as a conceptual, um, let's say, um, I was, it was not written as part of the concept. And in the conversation with the young curators, it was Karol Pikarski and uh, uh, Piotr Marek, we were kind of thinking that this ghost tram, I mean, we knew that it gonna trigger some diff different reactions, but we never thought in that dimension that it will touch uh, the concentration camp in Auschwitz. There's a, a sentence you so much love of, of uh, the philosopher Kant, where he talks about the starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. Why, why did that sentence 
mean so much to to you? <laughs> I, I, well, while you were speaking, Paul, and I think this is part of the um, synesthetics when we listen to someone or listen to something like music, that it already generates images. I have to admit that um, this is throwing me directly into that wonderful journey of two years at the Resonant at the Jewish Museum in Berlin. Yeah, I mean, there is this beauty and it's, let's say, conceptual, contain, contained and enriched architecture by Daniel Liebeskind. But at the same time, it's driven by the, let's say, the, the terrible genocide happening in Germany. So again, we have this contradiction. We have the beauty and we have the idea of a museum, which we always connect to content, maybe objects or any kind of items or special experience. But then most of the museum, and this is the most, let's say, remarkable or kind of trademarking the Jewish Museum in Berlin is its importance in terms of the voids. So the void becomes the most defining component in how people would describe their reflection of their experience. To be invited as a non-Jewish member of the German society to come as an artist and to get a complete carte blanche situation was such a burden. It was such a, a challenge. A burden, yes, it was a burden, yes. I felt the pressure to be invited there and to be the first artist ever to get this three of those voids to in, incorporate and operate. So in my first draft, I, I wrote about the experience that I put my hands against the walls, but not with the fingers, but with the backside, even more sensitive, just to get the temperature of the concrete to understand what the voice does to the physical presence of what we call the body. And what does it to the brain? What does it to the thinking? What does it to the idea of to feel as a gestalt, as one in total, as a, as a complex system, to understand what it could do to anyone, and including myself, being there, exposed to the unexpressible, exposed to the unspeakable. And it was a very strong uh, moment. And I was very glad that the curators, Leontine Meyer von Mensch and Gregor Lersch, gave me complete freedom to operate in this three voids. What did you do with that freedom? I took it a little bit far beyond, honestly. I excluded, or no, I included uh, the freedom of being invited to invite another 250 musicians worldwide to contribute with musical skits, 60 seconds frequency of sounds in words, in vocal, in electronics, whatsoever, to give it to me and present it with no authorization and no curatorial criticism or any kind of command. Give it back to those who are coming to those um, three voids and experience it in a rotating light and sound installation called Resonant. It was all about that, to be there and be part of something which is coming and going through our brains, body and physical representation. And also choreographing the, the, the body of the audience to be part of a movement of a choreography with their own hidden agenda, so we don't know if people would go left or right or slow or fast or whatsoever. I've seen so many people there dancing, performing without any score, without any order. It was so related to the self-confidence of each individual visitor. And you know, there are 3,000 a day. We had 1.5 million people in 18 months experiencing the space of resonant. The sounds, the light, the broken turning mirrors, where the physical bar parts of the body had been reflected and separated and put together in a new way. But never, think, but never objects. No. You never bring an object into a space. No, but I brought in questions I never thought before. 
When you brought invite, in questions rather than objects. Yes, I brought in a question which is, I found quite interesting. Dimitri Hild, um, uh, Hegemann, he's the founder of the Tresor Club in Berlin. So through his connection, we also um, established a connection to Mike Banks, who is one of the founder of Underground Resistance in Detroit. When he came, and I have to tell you, this is a very interesting experience. He was invited to come to perform inside the voids as a, as a techno musician. And he was thinking about putting relation of resonance, I mean, physical sound resonance to his work. But he called me and he said, Misha, I cannot come to the museum. I said, why? There is so much police in front. He, as an American um, artist, he was not aware that Jewish um, premises Jewish uh, buildings and institutions in Germany needed to be protected by the police. So he thought maybe something special is going on. But this is the daily life situation. We got so used to it. But for him, it was an obstacle to enter the building. Once he was there, he was calling his mother. And his mother was crying at the phone. He said, you know, son, we are part of a black Jewish community in Detroit. And now you are in the wonderful building of Daniel Lebeskin and you're doing this performance there. I'm so glad. I'm so proud. And he, he told us and he was crying himself. It was such a touchy moment. And then Dimitri asked me, oh, can we dance now in the Jewish Museum? Can we dance Why we remember, Why we pay attention and pay respect to those who could not survive the Holocaust? the Shoah, can we do this in this particular building? And if we find an answer for this, I'm just putting the question out there, if we find an answer for this, what would the answer offer as an option to interact inside a building? What, what is the difference between walking and dancing? What is the difference between listen to the sound of techno music or listen to the sound of a speech by Alexander Kluge? So that's, that's the freedom I experienced in Resonant. And I'm sure it was a very rare and very few moment in the time of curatorial practice that this was possible. What, what, what kind of memories do you have of um, a German silence about the past? It, because uh, it seems to me that I mean, I grew up with that silence to, to some extent. Um, but I'm, I'm curious in, in your case, what, what kind of silence you were confronted to when you were growing up? Because it seems to me that in some sense, maybe, maybe I'm mistaken, but in some sense, your work as you've described it in, in, in the time we've had together today, is in response to that silence. Yes, it's, it's also true. Um, I have to admit that I'm in the kind of, on the threshold between two generations. Right, yes. Born in 1959, I could take an advantage that the um, student revolution, which was a opposing and also exposing um, the, uh, the silence of the, of the parents. So in my generation, it was already grandparents. My father was born in 1938. My mother was born in, in 1939. So there, that as little as they could experience themselves, I could have addressed my critical questions only to my grandparents. And already, a discourse, a, let's say, a wording on this already had been established through this um, wonderful um, energetic uh, criticism by the student uh, revolution and student movement. In, I was taken, uh, going to school by 1965 and uh, the, the, the student revolt starting in 1967. So I only could see that in retrospect even though I was quite young, 12 and 13, when I started to reflect on this movement because it was so strong and the shadow of its um, Im impact 
already reached us as juvenile um, um, and um, let's say curious youngsters. So I was I was kind of mesmerized by this. And I was addressing, maybe I was kind of incorporating and inheriting this question, but this is an observ observation you brought into the play right now, Paul. I have to think about it. Well, it's, it's, it's my trigger to you. Okay, thank you for this. It's my trigger to you. I, I will end with three triggers in the form of quotations that I would like you to react to. I, I often say that I'm a quotomaniac by profession and quotations matter greatly to me because they are precisely triggers. And I often use the same quotations on different people because the reaction is so interesting and so diverse. The, the first one is by uh, James Turrell, who uses light in such an interesting way. And I'm, I'm curious how you would be in dialogue with him with this quotation in mind. He said, we eat light, drink it through our skins. Seeing is a very sensuous act. I'm wondering how that resonates for you at this moment, being there in that synagogue. Yeah, light is very poor in here, obviously. <laughs> But it doesn't matter because what it does is that it allows us to communicate. I have to admit that when I did the worked on the resonant uh, project at the Jewish Museum, um, a, um, a family, the family Rosenkrantz, made a donation to the Jewish Museum of an oral, uh, completely light field of uh, James Turrell, and they built in the park in the backyard of the Jewish Museum. They built an own pavilion just to host this wonderful installation. I've been there several times during that process, and I have to admit that the sublime uh, impact is very strong. And I understand that light resonance to the photons in our cells. So we eat light as we digest it. And as we are, right, literally. Yes, yes. Also, I mean, it basically maybe not through the mouse, uh, so so much, but through the whole body, the skin as the largest organ, yes, is is eating the light. Uh, uh, that that struck me so much, Misha, when you when you said that you touched the walls of the Jewish Museum with the, with the outside of your hands. Yes, because yes. they're more sensitive. Yeah, and that, this is something you can experience. You you feel the color in the in the oral uh, air, uh, installation by James Turrell. You feel the color. You feel the you color. Know, as you I feel grow the older, blue and the red. As I, grow, as I grow older, color has more and more of an impact on me. I, I've been wondering, has something changed? Um, I, but I just feel more and more um, inebriated uh, and, uh, by, by color. And this brings me to my, my, my second quotation of Roland Barthes, who said, Language is a skin. I rub my language against the other. It is as if I had words instead of fingers or fingers at the tip of my words. My language trembles with desire. So here it, it, it works quite beautifully with what you just said previously about the whole body being affected. Yeah, I think also this, I mean, as light can bridge distance between objects and subjects, between people, between generations, between the past, the present time and the future. And I would see that, um, as you know, in the Bible, it says, you know, and there were light. How can we say that? How can we record this. We can only record this because there was light as a phenomenon and there was logos, the word to describe it. Without these two components, we cannot do anything. We cannot recept, receive, we cannot deliver, we cannot reflect, so we are dead. So this is the, I mean, this is so essential to life to have these I mean, not only since we are heliocentristic um, individuals and um, uh, anthropologists would say that, you know, we are, we are 
moving towards the light. We are attracted. We are triggered. We are we are torn that that direction. Like 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 a like a sunflower. Exactly. So you you turn around, but also we need the word to describe it because it's it's part of our DNA that we have to deliver. We have to we have to express. Without the expression, we don't get feedback. Without feedback, we are not existing. <laughs> Do, do you know the origin of the word infant? The origin of the word infant is someone who doesn't yet have the phatic quality, who can't yet express. So an infant is literally someone who is before language. Makes sense to me. Right. So when, when we learn, when we learn to talk, We go from infancy to perhaps childhood. Now, in, in closing with the idea of trigger, really, of trigger and what it, what it means to be triggered, but also what it means to avoid to look straight on to what is in front of you. There's a line by Hertha Müller that has always moved me deeply where she says, the words in our mouths do as much damage as our feet on the grass, <laughs> but so do our silences. And I'm wondering how that, that resonates, as it were, with you. I think she, I mean, this already is a, um, a condensate out of life experience as an author, And I think she, what she embeds in this phrase you're quoting right now is this exactly accordingly to the um, debate of what generation had been operating in, in the regime and did not find the word to express their experience. So silence was not maybe intense, um, intense, intended as a, as a blockade to deliver. And it's not meant to be maybe as an aggressive act, but it's also a loss and an absence of words for what happened. So I think the cultural production is part, part of the cultural production is to find words to express these very um, extreme um, experience of those who were either being part of the system or being victimized through the system. It doesn't matter what side. For both, it's an extreme experience. I'm not, it's not about being guilty or not guilty. It's about to find a word to express. And I think the, the, revela the, 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 basically the revolution was a trigger to break this silence because it was so strong, the impact, that the silence broke and then people had to speak out. And Hertha Müller is maybe a good example how she try to moderate between these, let's say, extreme circumstances. So, and then, uh, and then of course, there are different kinds of silences. There's a silence we keep, and then the silence that comes out of a, an impossibility to express. And what I find, what I find so alluring and interesting in your word, work is that you're, you're not using words. But sometimes I do. There's this project, uh, Dysotopia, when, but I, I, I take this as another light projection. It's on a track and it's moving from one place to another. And while it's moving, it's changing from utopia to uh, topia and dysotopia. So it is in front of our eyes, things are happening. And it's about our relation to these words we are looking at, why they're changing, It's also, also reflecting on our situation because there's, and there's nothing frozen. Everything is in progress, maybe for good or bad, for maybe a better future or even worse. We don't know, but we have to continue. And so also this is a kind of a reflecting tool in public space, not maybe not um, to compare uh, with, the, uh, with the ghost ram in Katowice, but wherever it pops out, here in specifically in the city of Mal, which is under finance, a stressful situation, the cultural situation is under a certain um, observation. So, I mean, to put this up into public space in this kind of city, the, 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 the 
population, the people who are living there, the inhabitants, have to reflect their situation with the dystopia, the moment they are in a dysfunctional, in a, in a transit or what kind of uh, situation. So this was, I use words, but then in a very specific way. And you use words and sometimes you use words that you, you quote words as, as, as you did with a Porzilan poem. Exactly. Yes, and I'm, yes. I'm wondering in closing if you can give our, our viewers a sense of, of, of what you did with that Porzilan poem right in the middle of an urban landscape. Exactly. Um, it was also connected to the idea of resonant. Resonant was, it has like two mind maps. One was inside the museum, what it can do uh, once the visitor has entered the Daniel Libeskin premises with the, uh, the voids and it, its specific uh, connotation as architecture. But also the second mind map was what is the context of the Jewish museum in the city layout. And we found an early drawing by Daniel Liebeskind where he was marking the David star inside the city urban structure and he was relating it to some points. In specific, he pointed out an address, it's called Oranienstraße 1. And the idea was that Karl von Osiecki, a left-wingish um, journalist in that time, who died actually in the concentration camp of Oranienburg, had been living there. And Oranienstraße 1 is in Berlin, Kreuzberg. Uh, on the other side of the street, you find the big mosque of the uh, Islamic uh, community in that neighborhood. So we found the poem by Paul Celan of Oranienstraße 1. And we took the poem and posted it on a big, huge billboard and that specific address. And the interesting thing is, that we were kind of not sure what what would be a possible scenario. How would the this kind of neighborhood react to this poem? Also, we brought the context. You saw the drawing of Liebeskind and some information on Resonant. So it was kind of a making of a setup relating to Resonant, but outside the museum, outside outside the cons uh, the curatorial control. And what happened? It was very surprisingly it was that people from the neighborhood took an advantage from this trigger, checked online on the resources of Oranienstraße 1, found secondary literature as interpretation of that poem by Paul Celan, and made four copies and put it on the posted uh, billboard we brought there. So there was one layer and the other layer was initiated by the neighborhood. I think as an artist, you cannot even dream of. It's, it's been taken into consideration by the community. It was accepted and digested and reflected. And also they made it public to those who were interested to read and to understand because it's quite difficult to take less firsthand information from that uh, billboard. But it was now a public like, you know, it was like a wallpaper. It started to communicate. The word left the billboard and entered people's minds in a very specific topography. Misha Kubal, it's been such a pleasure talking with you. I really am very grateful for this moment with you. And I hope before long, when travel is again a possibility, I come and visit you um, in Strommel, and, and visit that synagogue if we can get in or just see it um, with you. That would be, you'd be a, a wonderful guide, I know. And I thank you very much for, for this thoughtful conversation. Thank you, Paul, for taking your time. And um, I would also like to visit you in, in Los Angeles and take a walk and, uh, and share ideas on, on your city layout and your ideas of memory and history. Thank you so much. Please do come. Bye-bye. All the best.